Hello, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Economics Department, the Walter Mather Center for Economics, Business, and Entrepreneurship, I welcome you today. I want to to Professor John Manter, who has been very kind, uh, inviting him, Steve Drongowski. And Steve is not a new uh, person for Ohio Wesleyan University. I think he's played, in fact, football before many years against Ohio Wesleyan. But also he has been, in 2007, uh, a speaker for the Walter Mare Center. In that time, he spoke uh, advertising the business of creativity. I want to welcome him. He will be presented today. Winners, Losers, and Why, the 2013 Super Bowl Advertising and Sports Marketing Ideas and Issue. I would like you uh, to welcome both of them with a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Patricio. I'm glad you're all here. Um, it's exciting to bring speakers in who come and bring so much experience, interest, and excitement about a topic. Uh, although in EMAN 210 we haven't started talking specifically about advertising, uh, we have this great opportunity to have um, Steve Drongowski with us. Uh, he's a principal currently at Game Changer, LLC, um, worked 25 years at Falgren, that's when I met um, Steve, including serving as both president and CEO of Falgren, large advertising agency here uh, in Columbus. Um, helped the agency to reach a 91st spot on the list of the nation's 100th largest advertising agencies. He's also past director of the American Association of Advertising Agencies. So he really understands how all of this works uh, day to day. So I'm hoping that you will listen to what he says today. Um, he has a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from Wittenberg University and began his career as a graphic designer. Um, so he's really seen all elements of advertising as well as having the experience of running an advertising agency. Um, he is, um, he said this is one of the few times that he's come to Ohio Wesleyan without a helmet, so he said to be kind to him. Those creative words came from Steve Jongowski, not from me. So with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce Steve Jongowski. Let's give him a warm welcome. Uh, thank you. I, uh... Just, just to be clear, I'm not going to teach you anything today. You have great teachers. You don't need a teacher. I'm just going to share with you some stories and some experience and so forth. And uh, I don't think there's anybody that didn't want to talk about Super Bowl commercials these days. So it's become basically a non-sectarian holiday, one of the biggest in the, in the country right now. And, uh, you know, people get together and they turn it into an event. And for many companies... Domino's Pizza, it's the number one sales day of the year, you know, and a lot of these companies are not advertising on the Super Bowl, but they're enjoying the benefits of the events and the whole thing that's going on around it. The, uh, the TV advertising has been great from an advertising agency standpoint, and what a lot of the people that I know, if I'd have been a better creative guy, I'd still be doing the creative stuff, but a lot of the creative guys that I know really enjoy it, and, you know, there's a lot of talk about what are the best spots, what are the worst spots, and so forth. But one of the things that I've seen happen over the years, and I'm old enough to remember the old, old Super Bowl stuff when this stuff just started. Uh, they used to be typical commercials, and then over a, a passage of time, it became an entertainment event. It's more about entertaining and inspiring people and getting them to like the products and the brands than it is selling it. You know, and, and there, are, there are different ways of measuring the performance of this thing o over the years. But uh, I just I want to talk about a couple of things uh, just to, to set it up, and then I want to show you some commercials. And, and uh, I would start by saying the ad business is a good one. It's a great business. I mean, it's, it's full of really terrifically talented people. I don't are any creative people here? Anybody? Well, I mean, to some extent, absolutely, we, we all are creative. But, uh, I mean, art majors, English majors, people that aspire to good. You know, I, you know I, I'm not saying you're good, bad, better, or different than, than anybody else, but I think that's one of the rich things about a place like Ohio Wesleyan or Wittenberg or any other, is you got a diverse student body and, you know, and being able to mix up the creative people in the conversation is a, is a great thing. But the creative people that I've come to know 
that have enjoyed creating commercials have really had an unbelievable experience. And some of them have been fortunate enough to create and experience the Super Bowl and to take their brands or their products that they represent to the Super Bowl. And it's, it's way different than the rest of the year. It's a lot different than a lot of people. Uh, so, I mean, today we're going to, there's a lot of ways that you can follow up on this stuff. And people are still evaluating the quality of the commercials that were aired uh, last Sunday at the Super Bowl. But, you know, today we're just, we're going to talk about them. We're going to review them and we're going to discuss some of the, the, the advertising that we saw. And, and we know that Baltimore won the 49ers loss. That's pretty obvious. I mean, it was, you know, we knew that the day of the game, but who were the winners and the losers, the best and the, and the worst, you know, among the sponsors who bought into the game, who brought us the game? They sponsored it so that we can see it. Um, who won? Who knows the truth? Truth be told, nobody can tell you yet. There are opinions about it. Nobody can define for you if somebody won and somebody lost. And there are a lot of ways to keep score of this. Um, so we know Baltimore won. We also know that this was the most watched TV event ever. And, and, and the Super Bowl is, has reached an unbelievable status that way. Three out of the four most watched programs in, in ever were Super Bowls. Top three uh, were Super Bowls. Uh, last year, the number one was the 2012 uh, Giants and Patriots Super Bowl game. Uh, that was the most watched program ever. Uh, number two was the Packers over the Steelers. And, and number three, was this week, the 2013 Ravens and 49ers. The fourth most watched super uh, program ever was in 1983, it was the finale to MASH. I don't know if any of you would even remember MASH. That was a very popular TV series. Their final, their final show was number, is still ranked as the number four TV show of all time behind the Super Bowls. And there's no reason to think that list isn't gonna get longer that way. Uh, I don't know yeah, how much you paid attention to this, but I just thought I'd mention that, that uh, the TV scoring system, you've all heard of the Nielsen company, the Nielsen ratings, and the way that people look at, at ratings and share of market and so forth. Uh, one rating point, okay, people tell you what, it, what a, a program's rating was. One rating point equals 1% of the nation's total homes that are on the air, that the Nielsen company has decided are on the air and have a TV on that day. So uh, over 114 million homes and you know, over 100 million of them, of those 114 had the TV on. And the share means that 71% of those TVs were on the time, at, at the time were tuned into the Super Bowl. That's a bunch. You know, that's a lot of people. You know, some people are football fans and some people were just in the house. Some people were there experiencing an event with family, friends, whatever. Some people were paying attention to the commercials. And, and those are pretty astronomical numbers. But, you know, history is made every time there's a Super Bowl anymore because it's just grown to an unbelievable point. Uh, things like sales, return on investment, uh, consumer response, and a lot more is going to continue to be measured over time. And they're going to be measured by different companies in different ways. Uh, all of those companies that are going to be doing that measurement created and produced ads that ran on the Super Bowl. And a lot of money, a lot of money was spent along the way. And you've probably seen some of the figures of what a spot cost and so forth. But uh, just to recap a little bit of that, 30 seconds on Sunday's game at the average advertiser, the client, cost them 3.3 .3 to 3.8 million dollars for 30 seconds of time okay that's that's you could have bought 15s those are a tough advertising format but 3.3 .3 to 3.8 million just buys you the time you know it costs a lot of money to produce the spot when you start to think about it that does not include that 3.8 million dollars doesn't include things like what it costs for Seth Rogen Paul Rudd and Bar Raffaele they were paid a lot of money to, to appear in the ads. They don't work for free. So it costs a lot of money to not only to bring in the talent, but to also to film and to produce and do the post-production and get that thing on the air. So it's a lot more than that 3.8 million that you saw. When you start to think about many of those spots we saw were 60s, 120 seconds, 
3.8 million for 30 seconds? You know, I wasn't a math major, but that adds up pretty quick. You start to think about how much money is involved in this. Um, so on the side note, I have no idea what GoDaddy paid Bar Raffaele to kiss that weird guy on national TV, but it wasn't enough. It just it wasn't enough. Uh, and you know, you went back and, and you start to look at some of those spots, and you start to look at, at some of those those times that were 60s and, and so forth. That a lot of money flowed through there, but. Uh, you know, I think some of the favorites, if you go back and look at the rankings, and we're going to be looking at some of those, some of those, most of the favorites were beyond the 30-second parameter. You know, they were bigger, longer spots, and it was more about entertainment than it was about sales. Let me, because I can, I want to go over a little bit of history of the Super Bowl, and because a lot of you are young, and, and, uh, and, and you may or may not have known that the first Super Bowl was played in 1967. That goes back a ways. You know, we're over 40 years beyond it. And what was Super Bowl 44 or 45, whatever it was that we had this year. You know, I didn't do the Roman numeral thing on this, but but you start to think about it. Um, you could buy a Super Bowl ticket for ten dollars. Ten dollars. What do you think they? Ch I have no idea what they charged in New Orleans this week, but I'll bet you it wasn't a ten dollar ticket to get in. They couldn't even fill the stadium. They couldn't fill the stadium for the first Super Bowl. And that was the Kansas City Chiefs against the Green Bay Packers way back when. And, uh, you know, it was, the, it was the end of the AFL-NFL war that was going on for years and years. And they, they decided to settle it with the Super Bowl. And eventually the leagues merged and so forth. But there were two networks that had individual contracts with the NFL and the AFL. So you could have bought a spot on NBC for the first Super Bowl for $37,500, gone nationwide on, on NBC. One on CBS would have cost you $42,500. You know, you compare that to the cost of a spot today and it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. But uh, that's, what the first, that's what the first Super Bowl was. And it went on a track up, you know, with odds and ends along the way, but it's still on a track going up. You gotta wonder how, how big that's gonna get, how, how high that number will get. But it's, it's getting up there right now. Um, all of those costs from the very first one started going up and it was all good until 1984. That's when Steve Jobs and Apple went after IBM, they launched the Macintosh. And what many believers, what many believe say is the greatest most expensive commercial ever produced, or expensive at the time, but one of the best commercials ever. A personal favorite of mine, so, because I get to give the talk, I get to put it in 1984. Uh, so I, I, I do want to play that for you here because I don't know how many of you have seen it or paid attention to it. I assume if you were smart enough to get into Ohio Wesleyan, you know who George Orwell is. Have you all read that somewhere along the line, 1984? I mean, it was an unbelievable commercial based upon that, that story. And uh, it was just a classic spot. And we'll take a look at that right now if I can figure out how to do this. There's no making fun of me for... computer will introduce Macintosh and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. I 
hate that slate that's on here right now. So get rid of that because I can, I think. Uh, that helps. Let's see, get rid of that, period. Um, that commercial was, I mean, that, was, that made history. It made careers all over the place. I mean, you're familiar with the 1984 story, and you've all heard of Steve Jobs and have become aware of, uh, how many of you do not use an Apple product these days? I bet everybody does. You're rare if you don't have some exposure to Apple, either as a consumer or somewhere along the line, using a pad or whatever you're, whatever you're doing with them. But that's when Steve Jobs declared war on IBM in 1984. They decided to run that commercial in Jobs' way. He had a relationship with an ad agency and, and uh, California agency and careers were made out of this thing. Uh, they hired the great film director, I don't know if you've read this or heard of this guy, Ridley Scott. Anybody know? Anybody a film buff here? Ridley Scott, a wonderful story, he's the, the, uh, the director, a film director who did Alien, Blade Runner, Gladiator, a lot of other great movies. He also does commercials. They hired him in 1984. One of the things he did was produce commercials, but he wasn't the guy you went to for cheap work. You, you went to him if you wanted big work and big ideas and so forth. And Ridley, uh, who he, he's unbelievable, he's just a very talented guy. Uh, incidentally, his brother, Tony, uh, was a wonderful director, committed suicide last August. Have you heard about Tony Scott? Tony Scott did wonderful, wonderful commercials or wonderful uh, movies, uh, true romance and you know movies like that. He did, he did some great, great big movies. So that, that movies are part of the family. And we'll get into a little bit more about that uh, a little bit farther down. But uh, he hired, you know, Apple hired Ridley Scott to be their director. They had, uh, you know, Ed Creatives, a guy who's one of the legends of the business, a guy named Lee Clow. And uh, Lee Clow suggested that lady run down the, the track in the middle and throw a baseball bat at the screen at the bad guy. Do you think I would have been a little bit? Ridley Scott said, no, no, you really need to throw the metal hammer and talked her out of the baseball bat thing. And, and uh, it was a whole different spot than it would have been. But, you know, there, there's a lot of legends that have come up around this thing. But, you know, it, it's uh, the writer of the spot now runs Ogilvy and Mather. Global runs Lo Ogilvy and Mather. He was a creative guy who wrote the spot that the guy was saying on screen, Lee Clow was the art director who grew up to become the president of an agency. Careers were made out of this thing. It took off, you know, and it was, it, it started the war with IBM. And along the way, it launched the Super Bowl spots. It redefined what the people would expect to see at the Super Bowl in terms of a commercial. The little cheap stuff wasn't gonna work anymore. A picture of the guy walking two miles for a camel and things like that wasn't gonna work anymore. People wanted something bigger and better and different. And, and it started to take us on the track to more entertaining commercials. Uh, the, the, uh, I was an art major, so I missed up my, my there we go, my script is all messed up. Uh, it changed a lot of things in a lot of businesses. And, and uh, among them was the Super Bowl and the advertising that it brings to us. The ads are bigger and better than they've ever been before. And I don't know how long you've been following the Super Bowl, but every year you seem to see bigger, better stuff, and people look forward to it. People look forward to the opportunity to say, what's the big one this year? And how are we going to keep track of that? Uh, I, I would suggest that adverti or, uh, 1984 made advertising better, period. Not just better advertising, but they made the whole the whole business of advertising better. Uh, it certainly has made Super Bowl advertising more entertaining. Uh, it's made us keep score as we measure success and failure of our ads. And incidentally, a lot of you have probably seen the USA Today starts ranking these things uh, with something called the ad meter. Now, I don't know, how, have you gone over the ad meter? So there's, there's this is very interesting. In, in 1989, uh, 
USA Today decided, okay, we're going to come up with a way to score and rank these spots. Everybody's talking about Super Bowl spots now. So they started the ad meter. And essentially, in case you read about the ad meter, and we'll talk about it a little more today, but the ad meter is basically a little device that, you know, they get a couple hundred people in McLean, Virginia, and a faraway city, and they have a little dial on it. And in real time, they go up and down during the commercials and how they feel about do I like it? Do I hate it? Do I like it? Do I hate it? And it ends up in a resulting score by spot. You know, and they keep track of the scores in the first quarter, the second quarter. Uh, they, they're a little bit off track. In the halftime, they don't cut a lot of it, or they don't rank a lot of it. They don't rank local spots. Uh, they do the stuff that's close to the halftime stuff. You know, the national stuff, the big stuff that they get a premium price for. That's what they want to score, and that's what they want to measure. And, and uh, a lot of stuff doesn't get measured along the way. A lot of stuff does. And then they publish it. And then history is made because for weeks, companies will be out there cutting releases about how their spot was good when the world says it's bad. You know, the ad meter may say, eh, it wasn't so good, GoDaddy. The GoDaddy guy will make his excuses. He will say, yeah, it was great for us because of the number of times people ordered the GoDaddy. You know, so it, it, dep it depends on the company, but the ad meter itself is about likability. You know, they dial it up and they dial it down. So as you see the scores, and we're going to talk about a little bit about that moving forward, um, that's what the ad meter is about. Um, <laughs> that was launched, by the way, in uh, the Cincinnati-San Francisco game. Cincinnati was in a Super Bowl once. In case anybody is wondering. We're still waiting for the Browns. Cincinnati was there once, but we may not live that long to see it again. But uh, anyway, they, they had the mics and they did it. And, and uh, the, the consequence of all that and what ad meter does, the influence it has, is that they measure likability. They want their advertising to be likable. Likability gets the scores up. Doesn't mean you're gonna sell more products doesn't mean that you're going to be more successful as a business or relate to your customers necessarily. That means you're going to be more likable. That's what the ad meter is all about. Oh, there's this one uh, creative director down in Cincinnati. Really loves it because he says the only way, the only day in advertising where effectiveness is trumped by entertainment value. And he's right. I mean, that's, that is, uh, he's absolutely right. I mean, if you go into a career in advertising, you're about measure, measuring your performance based on your sales and a lot of other, the, the, the things that, that uh, the business purpose that, that you have going. But uh, Super Bowl is different. Super Bowl is about entertainment value. And people are hoping they'll get the ad meter scores up and that people will like them. Doesn't mean they're gonna sell anything more than anybody else. Uh, so today, many of us keep score with the USA ad meter. You know, we look at those scores and so forth. And, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, if you've not been following the ad meter, right, have, has anybody been reading the USA Today and following what, what has done well, what hasn't done well in terms of the rankings? No? The, uh, it, it, this is really interesting because, especially this year, the number one spot was the... Uh, Budweiser reunion spot. Does anybody remember that one? When the little pony grows up, it gets off the harness and he goes running through the streets of whatever city they were in, some big city. And the guy that raised him came back three years later. That, that commercial, I mean, this is an unbelievable story, that commercial was directed by a guy named Jake Scott. Jake Scott is Ridley Scott's son. It's, it's so hard to believe. I mean, he grew up making great commercials. He had a little bit part some task he worked on on 1984 with his dad. I just think it's a rich story that, that Jake Scott did that spot, which, by the way, was my favorite this year. I thought it was great. I thought that was just a great spot. It's not going to change my beer brand. You know, it's not going to make me drink more beer or anything. But it sure, I thought it was very, very genuine for Budweiser. I also thought it was interesting that some of the other Budweiser ads were not as popularly received. They were part of the, the Belgian company that they were acquired by. They were the Belgian brands. They weren't the genuine American brands. And the Budweiser 
Clydesdales that's a genuine American thing and that was a big deal you know I, th I think it showed in terms of the way people reacted to that thing um, you know, I'm not saying anything politically about that I'm just saying you know it's Budweiser was the Clydesdales and people like that and and you know they don't know any of the, anything about these Belgian brands they need to be brought along before they like them to that extent but the I'm not aware of a Belgian hot horse that ran through the streets in New York. So that's, that's uh, for what that's worth. But uh, uh, what I'd like to do is review the best and worst spots in this year's Super Bowl. Along the way, we're going to review the best and worst as this determined by Professor Manners' students. How many, how many here are, are working for Professor Manner here and they've ranked their spots and so forth? All right. I have tried to combine those with the ad meter rankings and so forth. And it was, it was pretty, there were some interesting things that in some cases, the class ranked the spots higher than, than the ad meter ranked them. And some you ranked lower. I thought that was interesting, you know, and, and it's a matter of how many people and so forth. There's a, a scoring system, but I did it my way. So I, I did, I, I ranked them according to, uh, how many votes they got by by spot who who liked Clydesdales so that was how they did it and then we we uh, combined that with the uh, the uh, ad meter scores um, so I'm going to play the top top 10 and bottom 15 there's the the top 10 spots combine them with some of the bottom end spots from the ad meter uh, show you where they ranked with Dr. Man or Professor Manor students and we'll see when they aired, we'll see what part of the game they aired in, we'll see how long they were, and we'll see what, you know, how they scored in terms of likability. So it'll be a nice kind of comparison there. So we're gonna walk through that. Uh, so you're gonna see how some of these were ranked by, and I, I bet they're pretty close to the way you all feel about them. Uh, if we don't run out of time, I've got all of the spots here. So feel free to ask questions, to make a request or whatever, and we can look at any of them or review any of them along the way. Uh, why? Because I've got the mouse. I can do that. Um, the number one spot was the Budweiser Clydesdales. Uh, it was a two minute, or a uh, two thirties. It was a one minute spot. It wasn't a 30. So I have no idea what Budweiser negotiated in terms of their, their time and so forth but they paid more than 3.8 million for the time. And I'll guarantee you they paid more than a million dollars for the production because that was done at a film quality level that was pretty rare. Uh, it appeared in the third quarter, which I will say is, is that's a good time because then you're back into the game and so forth. Uh, this year was a little bit odd because of the power outage and so forth, but it's very risky to be a fourth quarter spot because if it's a route, a lot of people leave the game. Uh, don't pay attention to your commercial if you are scheduled to run towards the end. So that, that's the, the time is uh, time that the ad runs is important. But on that one to ten meter, five boats from from Dr. Manners' class. Uh, we got a seven seven five. Uh, it was a third quarter ad and a one minute spot. Let's see if I can do this. Love the spot. I'd love to see this spot. Does it have to be reloaded or what? This one here. Is this like one 
Yeah. You want your set client? Yeah. You want it full screen? Yep. Thanks, guys. Go full screen first. I really need professionals. You want me? Yep, full screen? Yeah. To my love, took it down. I climbed a mountain and I turned around. That's great. When you talk about the production costs, the, the film, and so forth, the other thing we didn't talk about was what did it cost them to get Stevie Nicks to do Landslide for them? She owns that song, I would assume, or somebody owns that song, and it's not a cheap one. You know, they, they weren't shy about piling that on there. So that was a big deal. The second, or the second one we're going to see was the number three on the ad meter. Got two votes in the class. The Dodge Rams spot, that was two minutes. That was a two minute spot in fourth quarter. Fairly risky to do that, you know. But uh, rank 7.2 on the happy meter. That wasn't bad. And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, milk cows, work all day in the fields, milk cows again, eat supper, then go to town and stay past midnight at a meeting of the school board. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to sit up all night with a newborn colt and watch it die and dry his eyes and say, maybe next year. I need somebody who can shave an axe handle from a persimmon sprout, shoe a horse with a hunk of car tire, who can make harness out of hay, wire feed sacks, and shoe scraps, who planting time and harvest season will finish his 40-hour week by Tuesday noon and then pain in from tractor back, put in another 72 hours. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend to pink combed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadow lark. So God made a farmer. It had to be somebody who'd plow deep and straight and not cut corners, somebody to seed, weed, feed, breed, and rake and disc and plow and plant and tie the fleece and strain the milk, somebody who'd bail a family together with the soft, strong bonds of sharing, who would laugh and then sigh and then reply with smiling eyes when his son says that he wants to spend his life doing what dad does. So God made a farmer. You know, I, I uh, contacted a lot of my friends on the creative side this past week to ask them what were their favorites. What were their favorite spots in terms of the Super Bowl? Not, you know, for any other measurement other than they liked it. These guys, and these are guys that had done big work and had done Super, Super Bowl or national level work and knew what went into it. And almost to a man and a woman, they said the ram. It was the ram spot, the farmer spot. And there are a lot of people that will tell you that it might have been a good spot, 
and this is a non, non-creative view, even though the creative people loved it, a lot of people would tell you, we've got a declining agrarian population, kids aren't going to go into the farmerhood, and those folks that are there already aren't going to change their minds between a GM, a, 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 a Dodge, a Ford, or whatever. They're, they're already set. So will it sell anything? I don't know. But I mean, it was, it was more of an image spot for Dodge. Uh, heck of a spot. Very moving. You know, and a lot of people had tears in their eyes over this one. And, you know, the memory of Paul Harvey, who you probably all don't remember that, but Paul Harvey, I mean, he's, he's been dead for some number of years, and they cleaned up a speech that he made a while back. And uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty powerful spot from a creative standpoint, but it may not sell an extra truck. It's pretty interesting, pretty interesting the way it tracks. Um, two minutes. You know, it, it, it was fourth quarter of 720. Uh, the other one, the Jeep family spot. I don't know if I can find that one. That was the one with Oprah. Anybody remember that one? Am I doing that? Am I making that noise? Oh, gosh. Come on, where's, where's Oprah, 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 where are you? It was a great spot. It was ranked pretty high. Here we go. There will be a seat left open, a light left on, a favorite dinner waiting. Warm bed made. There will be walks to take, swings to push, and baths to give. On your block, at the school, in your church, because in your home, in our hearts, You've been missed. You've been needed. You've been cried for. Prayed for. You've been the reason we push on. battle is just knowing this is half the battle because when you're home we're more than a family we are a nation that is whole you don't get a bigger voice than Oprah's, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty powerful stuff. You can make the case that Jeep and, and, and uh, Dodge were really centralizing around the Americana theme, you know, and they, they wanted to leave that impression, that, that image for everybody. And they looked at that as very, very positive for their business. So I think it was more about image and positioning than it was about selling, selling a Jeep or selling a car or whatever. They wanted to work on their likability, and I think they did that. Uh, got two votes for the number nine spot from the ad meter uh, for Hyundai. I think I made an assumption on which one we wanted here. because I got the mouse. Hey, 
give it back. Come back when you have a team. <laughs> okay. Mom looks pretty serious in this one. Yeah, uh, this might be interesting. Is if, if you're following the ad business and you're looking at different ad agencies, the Koreans uh, send a lot of their work to a government-owned ad agency called InOcean. Out in, well, they got a big office out in California, so they represent a lot of these brands. Hyundai and Kia go through the Korean ad agency, and they do great work. They really do great work. Got a guy who used to work for me. He's out there doing big car stuff. Uh, he's on, on about every year on the Super Bowl, and uh, but it's 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 unusual to have a government-owned ad agency. And that's that's what InOcean is, which is a Korean-owned ad agency. So they, you know, the the big products that come out of South Korea, they've already hired their agency. They they're guaranteed that's where it's going. It's just I just thought that was interesting. But uh, there may be opportunities there. They're a pretty hot shop, and, and uh, probably mean, you know, looking, if you're pursuing your career, it's probably going to be head west. You're going to head out to the west coast to work for an in ocean unless they branch out. Uh, let's see. All right. Oh, Taco Bell. Yeesh. I'm surprised that, oh, here we go, Audi. We're gonna, we we got uh, Audi next. This one got five votes. It was the number 10 on the ad meter. And where's the prom spot? That's a pretty good spot. It's up high. There we go. This was a great spot. Lots of people go by themselves. No, they don't. <laughs> hey, son. Have fun tonight. <laughs> good 60 second first quarter 6.64 five votes by the class right I mean it's pretty highly ranked across the board Taco Bell eight votes that may have been the most that may have been the most popular Probably by you young people, because they made fun of old people. Is that right? They made fun of us old people. Is that right? It was, it was eight votes. It was number 11 on ad meter. Good night, Mr. Goldblatt. Good
<laughs> Live Moss. No, that was, was great. I'm not a big Taco Bell fan, but I got to tell you, yeah, they got a six, five, five, eight votes. Number eleven. That was a pretty well accepted spot. Very, very well liked. Uh, yeah, I'm. I was just going to go down a list of these things, but if you guys want to see anything or ask anything, there's, there's no reason we have to go to specific spots. You know, I. Who's got questions? Who's got ideas? Well, in terms of the ad meter, they're they're not likable ads. They don't they don't entertain and amuse people in terms of the ad meter. Uh, but there are those who think that that uh, Bar Raffaelli with the nerd ad for GoDaddy. There are a lot of people who think that that was just the worst ad ever, and a lot of people think that's pretty good. A lot of people have have started writing up that. That thing really works because they're trying to talk to the guy who never gets the girl. They're a consumer. I mean, it's based on consumer insight and who, they, who they're talking to. They're talking to the guy who is, you know, works in their office alone and he's the AV guy and, you know, he, ain't the, he doesn't get the pretty girl, but he's the one who goes out and, you know, buys the, the GoDaddy stuff. And so that's, that's kind of interesting that... Uh, the GoDaddy people are pretty, really pretty happy with that. I don't understand it. I didn't like it, but they weren't selling to me. They were selling to the guy who, who makes those purchases. So. How much of that is shock value? In other words, it gets people to water the fountain and talk about it the next day. Kind of like the Michigan uniform the other night that were, got awful yellow. You know, yellow shoes, yellow socks. No one likes them, but they're all talking about them. So I'm sure that manufacturer was very happy. Well, the, the surprise... The surprise Function is good. I mean, you know, the factor of, of not being ordinary, not being the same that people have seen. You want you want to grab people's attention, so that's valuable. But getting the attention and being likable can be two different things. You know, there's one thing about getting the attention, but uh, you know, it, it's in, it's not hard to be either. To get attention, you can do that with stuff that isn't going to be isn't going to make you likable. But, uh, you know, to do both of them, I think is hard, the combination. But uh, just getting the attention, I think, is important because you're competing with a lot of other images that are floating out there. So you want to be seen and noted, but you don't want to be remembered badly. Well, it, it depends on the company. You know, in a lot of the smaller advertisers, they just roll the bones and they say, you know what, we need to be seen. We're going to spend our whole budget on the Super Bowl because that's going to make us famous and it'll make our salesmen effective out there selling. I'll give you an example, Master Lock. Anybody remember any, any of the Master Lock ads? That's where they put the sights on it and they shoot a bullet through a lock. All right, so they ran those for years. And their whole strategy in doing that was very clear at the beginning of the year. We don't have a big budget. We're going to spend it all on the Super Bowl because we want to get famous, get our name out there so that our guys can go out there and sell that in the trade. That's, you know, that's, that's an interesting, you know, a lot of time they want to just get famous, you know, and they're willing to risk their budgets to do that. Gildan, uh, remember the Gildan ads where the, uh, Gildan is a long-standing apparel company, and typically they sell T-shirts that are made into silk screen shirts that you know you may sell at your bookstore. They may be you may have them here on campus, you may have them somewhere else, but they're an apparel company, and they're trying to elevate their brand and get people to buy these things that don't have a logo on them, or still keep that business where they're, they're perceived as a good. So they ran an ad in this thing, and they're trying to. They're betting pretty heavily on it. They did this spot the other night, and it was the guy that got out of bed, and he, you know, he's trying to get his T-shirt off of that girl, and, and I don't know if you want to see that thing or not. It, it's okay. But, uh, you know, they, they, it's 
sort of a sports marketing push for them because they're also sponsoring college football games and so forth to get the people to remember the name Gildan, their brand name, as a sponsor of the New Mexico Bowl or some other bowl game. Uh, and they, they, you know, they capitalized on that in a sports marketing strategy. And this is the first time they've ever been on TV, national TV. And they're trying to just stand on the quality of their product and their brand name. And they're betting the ranch on that with their budget this year. Now, it won't, it won't put Gildan out of business. They're, they're a pretty good-sized company. But uh, it means that they may, we may not be seeing them doing other things later in the year. But, you know, I've seen... It happens at the C level. It happens at the at the brand manager level. Sometimes the CEO says, "I want to be on the Super Bowl," and they figure out a way to get there. And sometimes it's the brand manager talks it up and figures a way to sell it through the system. But uh, there's a lot at risk for all of them, regardless of the size of the brand. Is that Spencer? I'm telling you, you're dead. You snuck out early. <laughs> well, we are kind of getting to the time. No, that's all right. I, you know, I, I was not blown away by the Coke work this year. Um, you know, the, when they had the, the, the chase going on, they found the Mirage or the whatever, the, the Coke bottle. I, if it works, depending on what they want to do, it's not going to sell me a Coke. Uh, I don't know who they're selling it to. Um, they'll know over time. They'll, they'll watch their sales and... I mean, so, so many people are on the Super Bowl because they're going after a certain segment or they're going after a certain consumer or they're going, you know, they may be going after a certain season of the year and they want to position themselves for things to happen. Uh, very rarely is it a same day sell. You know, they don't do that with a, a same day expectation. That's rare. You know, GoDaddy may claim that they, you know, the guys are out there buying the GoDaddy URLs or whatever. Uh, but, you know, people don't run out and buy their, their cars, but they're more inclined to make a purchase, possibly, because of what they've seen. The car dealers are probably more inclined, inclined to sell more cars because people have it at a higher share of mind early in the year. And that's a big big part of their sales year, is hitting the, hitting the ground running. Um, but I think it, it depends on the product, depends on the brand. Did Coca-Cola move me? No. no. Time will tell, I guess. They're keeping score their own way. I have no idea why they're doing what they're doing. But everybody's different. Okay, um, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on something. I've noticed that over the years, like when I was younger, there were a lot more commercials aimed at men, and it felt like they used women more as a lure, whereas now I feel like they're more targeting um, things like Americana or humor, um, young markets, or even women with some things. Why do you think that shift has happened? Do you think it's a societal thing? Do you think it's who has purchasing power now. I'm just curious as to hear your thoughts. Well, they all do it for their own reasons. I got a feeling they're following the money. It's purchasing power. It's the women are making decisions and 
Women are buying cars, making decisions that maybe they let somebody else make a long time ago. But maybe they're buying their own cars and they choosing their own cars. And, you know, whether they're in a family or whether they're a single mom or whether they're, you know, just a working person, you know, they have purchasing power that maybe they didn't have before. Uh, so the times have changed, but I wouldn't give the advertising business any more credit than just following the money. That's what they're doing. And they're helping their clients do that. So I think you're giving them a lot of credit. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just curious as to if you think it's just like a who has the money now or if it's like, like if it's more of a societal thing, which you seem to think it's more of a who has the purchasing power. Yeah, I, I, think, it's, I think it's a market thing. I think it's a marketing thing. Uh, and uh, if they're smart, they're not gonna. They're not gonna insult people. If they're smart, they're not gonna talk down to women who are capable of spending a plenty of money on a car. They're not gonna do that. If they do that, chances are they're gonna get whacked in their own building somewhere. You know, there's gonna be a higher ranking woman than them that will read them their beads, and and you know, and that's good. But I don't. I don't think that there's any. Anything as. Anything as good as just, you know these people are not better than other people. I mean, they're, they're not doing it for goodness. They're doing it to sell stuff. They're doing it to lit, read the market and make the sale. So yeah. that's, that's my opinion. That's the most defensible spot for anybody to be in. Well, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, all right, I gotta think of how to word this question. Um, so the 1984 ad is a foundation or like the pinnacle. Um, do you feel as if that ad made more companies think about purchasing time on TV or do you think that made more companies think about their ads that they're already purchasing time on TV, like what the actual ad would entail or do you see what I mean? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think a lot of it had to do with image. You know, get their message across and leave, leave an image for people to leave a strong statement. That was a strong statement. And they put some money behind it, you know, and they, they used an A director and an A production team, and you know, they weren't afraid to spend some money to do that. I'm a capitalist, I'm good with that, you know? I mean, that's, that's a good thing. And I think a lot of advertisers after that said, you know what, we don't wanna look like dog food next to the, the next Apple spot. You know, it's time, we, we need to step up to it to look better because the venue has changed, the whole arena has changed, and nobody wants to be the ugliest person in the arena, and that's, I think that's a lot of what they're doing. And, and Apple's, Apple started that going. You know, so they elevated the whole, I think they elevated the whole craft. They certainly elevated the Super Bowl. You know, and they, they really, they made their mark, you know, and they left their legacy, and a lot of people are, are living on the fruits of their labor, and that's a good thing. Thank you. Um, what kind of marketing strategies do advertisers use to figure out what consumers want? Because you've said that they're following the money and it's a big risk for them, but I can't imagine them all just taking such a shot in the dark like that. So what kind of strategies do advertisers use to figure out what consumers are interested in? What will appeal to them? Well, I think part of it is is the messaging, but I think there's a bigger a bigger thing in place because most most advertisers are working on an annual marketing budget, and they have X number of things, trade shows, and they have, you know, trade dealers and stuff to support along the way. They have PR efforts, and they have advertising efforts on the national and on the local level, and so they can't, you know, they they have to move the money around a little bit, so. Part of it is deciding what, you know, how and, and, and where they should spend their money. You know, and that usually happens in a building somewhere. And, you know, there's a lot of infighting, you know, about priorities and so forth. And a lot of people have, have to come to the decisions. Usually it's a collective decision that, okay, you know, these things need to stay and these things are worth putting aside and let's spend our money here, and they come up with a number, and they build their budget against what their objectives are. And there are a lot of ways to reach, you know, especially this day and age, 
the, uh, the Doritos spots. Anybody follow those? The fashionistas. I love the fashionistas. You know where the guys were eating the, the chips with a little girl in the wedding dress and all that stuff, and mom caught them eating chips? About 2009, I think it was, Doritos started this. They, this was a shocking thing in the advertising world because these are spots that are created by amateurs. And they come up with their ideas and they enter a contest. And Doritos buys them. The winner gets a million dollars, you know. That's money that didn't go into the, the agency, that didn't go into the creative team. But they, they produce and bring these things to, to life. And, you know, I mean, the, the, there were some guys that, that uh, did a Dorito spot. I'm trying to think. It might, might have been last year. For $200, they get a million-dollar payday. Their agency didn't get a nickel out of it. I mean, it's pretty interesting. And Doritos has it produced, you know. It's... They bring the idea to life so that the game has changed. All of a sudden, Doritos is dealing directly with their communities, directly with their consumers, and they're coming up with some pretty interesting ads. I mean, the goat thing, the fashionista ad, I thought that was hilarious. But they were done by amateurs. You know, truth be told, the folks in the advertising agency business would say, oh my gosh, that was done by amateurs. Well, they were pretty good spots, you know, and they're pretty effective spots. And they may have been done by amateurs, but they're selling chips to somebody somewhere, or Doritos wouldn't be doing it. So it's made them famous. It's elevated their brands. Okay, one more question. Go ahead, Sarah. No. Sure. Thank you Well, I mean, they define effectiveness in different ways in different companies. I think everybody wants to be, everybody that's in the Super Bowl wants to be seen. And they want to leave an impression. They either want to be likable or they want to be relevant. And, and uh, that varies from company to company. You know, they want to talk to a specific consumer or they want to talk to a specific geography even. You know, they, they, they want to be relevant, they want to be preferred. but. They have different ways of doing that. And each company will define that on their own. So that's a long way of saying, who knows? If anyone wants to talk um, to Peter afterwards, that would be fine. We appreciate all of you being here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it.